Hello, Alain. Welcome and welcome to everyone to the second in the Learn from Leaders series. In June, I talked with Mark McLean, the head of diversity, inclusion, and well being for MNG based in London. And today I have the pleasure of talking with Alain Moritz. Uh, welcome, and I'm absolutely delighted that you can join me to discuss my book today, Leading Global Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Now, Alain has extensive global experience. He's originally from France, but he's truly a global citizen. We were just talking about that a few minutes ago. He's lived in Boston, mm -hmm. in LA, in Puerto Rico, in Angola, Indonesia, Texas, and even, even on a ship that traveled around New Caledonia, if I'm not mistaken, in the Pacific. You're correct, Ronnie. <laughs> So he's currently the Senior Vice President for Energy and Resources for Sodexo in the United States. So I'm um, excited to have this conversation with you. You shared some amazing experiences in the book. And then you've had some incredible global roles. Can you share a little bit about your professional and your personal journey with the audience? So number one, uh, Roni, I mean, uh, hello. I mean, nice to be with you again today. I mean, we are we have been discussing a lot, so it's very nice to be. Uh, it's a pleasure to discuss with you, and uh, I'm great grateful that uh, my experience can be used by others as an example. So, uh, as you said, I'm. A, I will not. I mean, yes, I'm a global citizen as per your definition. That uh, I was born in France, right. then I left France when I was uh, 20 years old, and since uh -huh. then I never never came back. I mean, I worked everywhere in the world, but in France. Which is quite interesting anyway. So I started my uh, when I get my high school degree, which was late. Uh, I went to study in Boston at Northeastern and mm -hmm. uh, get my degree in finance, and started to move to Los Angeles and started to work in the service industry, uh, uh, in the fashion industry, to be in, uh, mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills, which was quite an exposure. I mean, again, because that was not prepared for that. Uh, then because of a uh, uh, visa issue, I have to leave um, the US and went back to France, did some summer jobs, so again, uh, being a lifeguard and everything like that, but not, nothing serious. And I get the opportunity to work in New Caledonia, so for your readers, which is a uh, French territory between, which is not too far away from New Zealand and Australia. Yeah. Awesome. So, I mean, <laughs> quite far and away. And I was uh, the pressure on the very small vessel uh, doing the island, going around. Mm -hmm. And so we were in Caledonia, in, in New Caledonia, sorry, there is some, uh, there's two populations that what we have is called the Kanak, which are the original people, uh, which were mm -hmm. there before the French people arrived. And we have the Kaldosh, which are the, the French people that came after the, during the immigration. Mm -hmm. And today, I mean, uh, if you read the news, today they are trying to see if Caledonia will stay, New Caledonia will stay a French territory or they will get their independence. So they're voting on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the time, that was not a discussion. So we had, uh, and again, we already have two group of people which are living in the same territory, but don't see the same thing the same way. So it's important to always realize yeah. that, uh, it's not going to be the same. I mean, the way you're acting, the way you're behaving may be misinterpreted by one community and correctly interpreted by the other. So you're always trying to be neutral, but it's not easy when you are very young. I mean, uh, you make some mistake. Uh, but anyway, it was a very good experience. And I left and I came back to work in the US for a, shipping, a cruising company called RCCL. Mm -hmm. And I was based in Puerto Rico, as you said and uh, worked over there, but I didn't like it too much. So I left very quickly. I went back to France and find a new job in, uh, for a service company again in uh, Angola, uh, which mm -hmm. was, uh, so I was working for a French company. And this French company was having uh, services in Angola and I was in charge of so Angola at the time was uh, during the civil war between uh, San Bibi and Dos Santos. And I was there to, as a, with UNAVM3, which was a uh, UN mission, and I was in charge with my company, the company I was working for, trying to protect the assets and the people of the United Nations. Again, so uh, Angola was, and again, a beautiful country, beautiful people under a lot of stress because the situation was so difficult for them. Mm -hmm. They were civil war and civil war, civil war lasted for so long that all value we are used to, we are gone. I mean, at the end of the day, you are trying to survive. You're just trying to get some food on the plate for you and your kids. And um, that changed a lot of the perception or the way you see life. Then um, 
left Angola uh, for the same company and then went to work in Indonesia. And uh, that's where I started my career today. And I was assigned to the island of Borneo and I worked in, uh, I was a site manager and I was uh, working for the biggest uh, coal mine in Indonesia in the world, it's called uh, KPC Sangata. And again, different experience with the first time I was exposed to the values and the culture of uh, people in Southeast Asia, uh, being an European. And uh, that was quite a cultural shock also because mm -hmm. whatever you believe, you can see that other people don't share the same value as you. I mean, uh, always a funny side that we have when we are in Indonesia, it's a concept of time. Um, we are we Westerners have a tendency to be very precise, use a watch. In Indonesia, it's much more an abstract uh, dimension, dimension. So we use the term besok, which can mean tomorrow, whatever. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow in five minutes or tomorrow in three months is the same word, it's besok. Uh, so again, different way to see that your life, I mean, not everybody sees the same as you and you have to learn how to respect those people uh, and try to understand them and be in a way, I would call it in a positive way, be a tourist, be willing to learn, put yourself in a position to learn. Uh, I loved Indonesia so much that uh, I found my wife there and I spent 12 years over there. But uh, everything has an end. And we wanted, we worked for the company called Compass at the time. And I was uh, transferred to the UK uh, in Aberdeen, in Scotland. So you spend 12 years where it's beautiful and sunny, the temperature is the same every day. And you arrive in Aberdeen and it's raining, it's snowing, it's cold. <laughs> my wife, <laughs> it was quite a challenge especially for my wife, because in her life, she never seen the snow before. It was the oh, first time. And our, our daughter was very, very, uh, very young. She was eight months old. So again, quite an experience. Beautiful country again, uh, fantastic people. It was, again, it was different again. So close from home, yet so far in terms of uh, what people were doing. Because again, I mean, I was coming from the country in the south of France. It's very sunny. And over there, mm -hmm. it's rain, almost raining every day at the time. So we have to adapt, we have to change, but we have fantastic friends over there and we still know them. I've been living, I mean, I left in 2011, so almost 10 years now, and we're still friends. I mean, we never see each other again, except by Zoom or by Teams or by Skype, mm -hmm. and yet we're still friends. So it's quite amazing, uh, the relationship we built. After uh, uh, the Aberdeen, sorry, I went mm -hmm. to work for Felix, so, and I went to Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And again, for Westerners, Saudi Arabia is a country full of cliché. I mean, uh, when you said you're going to be transferred to Saudi Arabia, it's not the country you're dreaming about. Yet again, I mean, uh, when you take the time to understand the, the country, to respect the people and trying to say, okay, let me be open and see why they are doing like this. Again, fantastic people, beautiful country. Uh, I really loved it. Uh, the, the time I spent over there was fantastic. And I have to learn again, I have to learn to adapt. And we speak, you and I will speak about that later, but we have some challenges to, 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 to face. And again, what can we do as people like me coming there? I mean, again, it was just an experience, but a beautiful country and I really enjoy it. And finally, I came back to the state. Uh, it's going to be what, three and a half years now. Uh, working for Sodexo. And today, as you said, I'm a SVP for yeah, now, so it means that we are looking at all the assets in the, in the US, uh, which are working in the mining, uh, petrol, uh, oil company, gas company, sustainable. Uh, so, and we're trying to develop and sell our services. And again, mm -hmm. Texas, it's a very, again, I really love the Texan people, nice people. So, but you have to adapt. I mean, uh, it's not because I'm French that nobody is gonna give me anything. So I have to adapt, I have to understand. My team is based in New Orleans, for example, so I have to work with them. I have to become, uh, I have to learn about the football and uh, the scent <laughs> and, the team, and, and the teams, because I, I really, and I get a fantastic person working with me, her name is Don, and she took me around this, uh, I mean, and other and it's Don, number one, but other people. But they are very pleased when you take the time to discover their culture, mm. those people like to share, and I think it's a fantastic privilege to be in my position uh, and to be the recipient of such a good word from those people and willingness to show me what is our country. Uh, I really enjoy that. Awesome. So that's why I said you're truly a global citizen. So there are three things that stood out for me in what you said. One was this whole concept of time. And you're so right. There's no right and there's no wrong, right? It's just different worldviews. Even 
for us, you know, when you go from the US to Europe, there's very different concepts of time, even between the French and the Americans, right? Yes. <laughs> so, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's all, it's relative, it's very contextual, and it's just a different way. There's no right or wrong. The other thing right. that, uh, that I found very interesting, what you said, was the fact that, you know, when you talked about Texas and Dawn and how she showed you around, how important it is to kind of link with locals, right? Yes, to really correct. To guide and to kind of shepherd and show you uh, the way things work in a particular culture, which I think is a strategy that you have really kind of developed quite well. And then the third piece, when you talked about Saudi, and that's where I met you. So we're going to talk a little yep. bit about that experience, because honestly, to me, Alain, when I went, as you said, I had my own sort of preconceptions about Saudi, and we met in Bahrain. And I had my notions of, you know, what women from Saudi were like. And when I went there and I spent that day with your team, it was just a fantastic experience for me. Very disruptive because the energy of the women in that room and how yep. excited they were, how enthusiastic, uh, really was a testament to the team you had built in a culture which not didn't necessarily kind of... Uh, uh, allow you to, you know, sort of develop and advance women. So, so let's talk a little bit about that. So the first principle in my upcoming book is called Make It Local. Yes. And uh, what I sort of have found is that for global diversity, equity, and inclusion culture change to be sustainable, to be effective, it has to be anchored in an understanding of the local context. It has to be informed by the local culture, by the local history by the language, by the laws, in a, you know, regardless of where you are. And with that information and understanding and knowledge, then leaders like you can disrupt the status quo. You can push for change. But what you did so well was that you did it in partnership with local change agents. You know, that's exactly what you did. You came in as an outsider, you pushed for change, but you did it partnering with the local change agents, taking their advice, taking their recommendations into, into play. So you shared some really powerful stories that I included in the book about how you respected the local norms while pushing for change to welcome the women to your Saudi office. So, and how you partnered to do that. So can you share a little bit about the situation, first of all, with regards to women when you came to Saudi, what was just not everyone may know, you know, it may be obvious to you, but not everyone may know what the situation for women was like in Saudi at the time, you know, in terms of laws, et cetera, and how this yeah. so you can just share that okay. and then what yeah, you I, did to address the situation. So when I arrived in Saudi Arabia, the, the country was still, uh, so King Abdullah was, uh, was the reign of King Abdullah, coming to the end of the reign of King Abdullah. Uh, but when I arrived, so the country was still under uh, strict Islamic law that we call the Sharia mm -hmm. laws. And as such, the as much women get a lot of freedom in their own uh, household and mm -hmm. uh, families, as much they were restricted to go outside. So, right. for example, uh, the Saudi system at the time uh, prevented the woman to take the plane by themselves. So they have to go, they have to get the authorization from a, a male figure. Yeah. Uh, it can be the father, the husband, the cousin, or even the son sometimes. Uh, so the women were, didn't have, in the outside world, the woman didn't have any right to be a human, uh, like, the, the, uh, like the Saudi males. They, they always have to be behind. They cannot speak to strangers. They couldn't drive. Uh, they couldn't go shopping by themselves. Or they can go only in stores where only women can serve them, because mm -hmm. the other contact with uh, foreigners was forbidden. Right. Uh, so that was the situation. But at the end of the day, which was quite interesting, because up to you were 21, or up to the time you finished your university, the women had the, the right to go to uh, to university, I mean, school for women, university for women but they didn't have the right to go into the workforce. They mm -hmm. were prevented to do that because they would be meeting uh, a lot of foreigners. That was not a foreigner to their family. And that was not accepted at the time. So very strong person. I mean, I think in the family, and again, I didn't have time to, or the occasion to understand that, but I think they were uh, trying to uh, 
in, within their family compound, they were okay. They could have right. The, the right to, to be themselves and, and to behave correctly. But uh, out, the outside world, it was quite uh, restrictive for them. Uh, very tough. And again, to my wife also, which is a Muslim person, mm -hmm. it was quite disruptive because in Indonesia, the women are much more, we already had a pr prime minister, a woman That's prime right. minister in Indonesia at the time. Yeah. And for her, so I think in Indonesia at the time, the, the, the I mean, whether you're male or female didn't make any difference. I mean, you yeah. have the right to grow and be a successful person. But in Saudi Arabia, again, different, uh, different type of uh, right. context. So that was the situation we found I found when I arrived uh, about the woman. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so you found this situation. Then yes. I saw what you did because, you know, I, this, you know, women in their beautiful embroidered abayas, but very, very vocal, very engaged. So what did you do to address the situation with regards to the women in Saudi? Uh, you know, so, somewhat as an outsider, you had the freedom to push for increasing the hiring of, of women. Um, you know, so if you can just talk a little bit about what you did to address the situation, yep. what are some of the challenges? I, I think you come back to one of your principles in your book. It's uh, the change has to make sense. And the key issue we had at the time was, uh, so again, so the so as a company always tried to follow Pierre Bellon principle which is you have to develop, you have to be a stakeholder on the local economy if mm -hmm. you have to have a sustainable footprint in, in this part of the world. But in Saudi Arabia, uh, because of the context, uh, majority of the workforce was expatriate, uh, right. like myself or people coming from uh, the, the Asian continent. And we had only a few, few Saudis. And we were trying to, uh, at the time again, uh, when King Abdullah, when I arrived, if you are trying to attract uh, young male Saudis, you are competing a big, again, biggest established company such as Saudi Aramco, such as right. Saabic, which are very big conglomerate. So we had a lot of difficulties and we prefer and also, to pay. The, and so also local Saudi companies, right? You were competing yeah, against yeah, the local Yeah, 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 yes. You, you're totally correct. Okay. And so we, we were, uh, we prefer to pay the a fine. Mm. Instead of trying to trying to attract young people because the market was short, really? and then you look around. So when you go to Riyadh, for example, you land at uh, Riyadh Airport. There's this huge university, one of the biggest I've ever seen, mm. where it's only only women inside. And you say, okay, why wow. those people are educated, and why can we they not come to work in the workforce? So we, we had the need. We had the need to expand our Saudi uh, citizens in our company, and also what we found out when King Abdullah. Did the change allow the women to work? You, we, we found out that if we can attract those people working for us, they were very well educated. Right. Uh, they were willing to work and very uh, eager to work. And if we make some modification and follow the uh, requirement at the time, which was enacted by Saudi Arabia, we can help the, the women to grow. That can help our company to pay less, less financial fine. Mm -hmm. And we can have very good people uh, which know the country better than us because we are, as you say, we are guests, we are foreigners, uh, but they know the kuchim, they know everything. They can help us to grow our footprint in Saudi Arabia by giving us indication what to do, what to do mm -hmm. and not to do. So it, it was, uh, so we tried. I mean, uh, when the opportunity was given, uh, again, the idea was, okay, let's try. And I know, and again, when I took the decision to go with the uh, uh, hiring uh, ladies, I had issues. I mean, my management didn't follow me. Uh, my team didn't follow me. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, again, I had some people uh, that were okay with me. But I remember one of the few fights I had with my uh, uh, my boss at the time uh, was about that. I mean, they said, look, mm -hmm. you cannot hire a woman. It's going to be a problem. I said, okay, look, I didn't see where it could be the problem. So you have to have a little bit of faith also in what you are doing. You're taking mm -hmm. a risk. At the end of the day, at some stage, you, you have to be willing to take a risk. And I remember the first time when I saw uh, one of those ladies coming in, and so she had the abaya on her, and you didn't see anything, you didn't see the right. hand, you didn't see the right. eyes, you couldn't speak to me. So she had, a, I think it was a, a father coming with her. And every time I was trying to speak to her, that was the father answering me the questions. Mm -hmm. 
So you know already that you have to change because uh, we don't realize that how important for us the visual messages from our hand mm. or face are, when we are discussing it's quite important. Good point. If I put everything in front of you and I blocked your visual references and the person cannot even speak. Mm. <laughs> so you have to find different. I mean, again, I was supported by a, a person called Nassim Mukbil, which was my HR manager at the time. And it was a great support because he knew the country. And I didn't, I, I didn't know. So if you understand what I was trying to do, and he supported me again, to come back to, you have to have local support. My local support was Nassim Bill. And he helped me a lot trying to open my eyes. I said, look, you have to accept what you're gonna see. You have to play the rules. And we can work with the time. Don't expect the change overnight. You have to respect those people as much as you're gonna respect you. And so, but that was the first cultural shock. I mean, uh, and again, trying to speak to somebody that you cannot see, cannot answer to you directly, it's quite a challenge for you. Yeah. So we started, like, we started like this. So let me just ask you two questions. This is really fascinating because really, if you view this situation through a very Western feminist lens, the working conditions for women would have been unacceptable. Correct. Because if you impose your values, your worldviews, you know, at the end of the day, the women wouldn't be able to work for Sodexo. So, you know, clearly you basically you had certain values. What was it that sort of pushed you to hire the women in the first place? Why, why did you do that? And then secondly, how did you sort of accommodate them in the workplace? Your workplace? Because I know you had a separate room initially for them with an intercom and all. So if you could just speak to both those things. So when we are, again, so come back to the second question first, maybe uh, right. uh, the first question last. Yeah, yeah. So when we, yeah. we hire those ladies, uh, again, when the King Abdullah uh, gave us a right to, and I say, because it's a total monarchy over there, so he has to give mm -hmm. us a right. He gave us a right, right to, we as a companies to hire women. What we did, I mean, he gave us a set of law that we have to follow. And I think the first rule, as you say, we have to respect the local laws, local culture. I'm not here to change everybody. And I mm -hmm. think if you want to make a big change, so it's important, but you have to start with a small step. Uh, and so what we agree upon, yes, clearly that was not, I have a wife and I have a daughter, a daughter and uh, that was not the way I see the, the role of the woman in the society. So, but mm -hmm. you have to accept that. I'm not here to put my view forward. Uh, right. I'm here to help the country to develop to what I believe based on my culture is a, a great situation. But you have to accept that maybe you are not to the point where those people are willing to accept your views. Yeah. And again, it's happened to me in Indonesia. I mean, for example, I'm Latin. Uh, so when I speak, you can see I'm using my hands. If you go to Indonesia, uh, when using your hands, it's a sign of lack of education. So you have to understand that the different values, different mm -hmm. culture, and you have to be willing to accept what people uh, believe and uh, mm -hmm. not judge and mm -hmm. trying to work with that. So that was the, the key message for us is, okay, let's start from ground zero. Let's give them a chance to start to get in because again, and at the beginning, I choose not to recognize them. I mean, I know that we're women because of the law, but they're also human beings. And they are, they keep, can bring us a lot of uh, advantages. And, and very highly educated, right? I mean, highly the educated, people more yeah. highly educated than the men. So Yes, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's yeah. much more willing Higher to educated. work also. I mean, mm. highly educated, willing to work. Correct. Because for them, at the beginning, I think the fact they couldn't, I mean, don't forget, I mean, at the time, I know it's a cliche, so I mean, maybe it's a cliche I'm saying, and maybe I would apologize for that. But I had the impression that the woman couldn't get, get, that, get that of the house. They were in the fact, very free inside the house, but outside right. the house, it was kind of a, like a kind of a jail, I would say, right. a jail, quote unquote. So the fact they can go somewhere else, um, they came to the workplace, at the beginning, it was very difficult and for them and for us. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, uh, when you're making a change, you have to be willing to take the time. I mean, uh, we have the French president used to say before, give time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very strong statement, I believe. So we have to accommodate the law and we have to respect the local culture. And so they were afraid to speak to us. They were, we were afraid to speak to them. We, did, we didn't want to cross any boundaries. We Correct. were very respectful. Uh, it took us a little bit of time to get them at ease and say, okay, you can contribute. What we also wanted to do, Roini, is to make sure they contribute to the company. 
So we didn't want to do it just for the sake of doing it, right. but we wanted them to be involved and to have a share or a participation on how well the company will develop itself. So it's not like I put you in a, in a room, I give you a computer and do whatever you want to do during the day. You have tasks to do. You have a, like if you were a normal employee, because we try to see them as employees. They have to create a, every employee in a company as a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so it was important for us to give them a purpose, to be there, to be, uh, and to feel again that they were contributing to the com to the well-being of the company and the other employees. So that was very important for us, really. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're trying to drive all the time. So, it, I mean, it took some time. Uh, I will be fair with you. It wasn't obvious. It took uh, almost a year. But when the ladies starting to realize that we, because of Stolexo values, you are an employee, and we. If you have something to say, you have to say it. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, safety, for example, we have the stop program where everybody can stop us if we are making a mistake. Mm -hmm. We accept that, I mean, in my management style, but I think in sort of style also, we accept to be challenged by our, our team. Uh, again, we are welcoming that because we cannot see everything. I mean, it's difficult for us. Mm -hmm. So when we start to realize that we, hey, we are looking, not only we want you to contribute by doing tasks uh, for the company, but we are also looking for your opinion. Your ideas. And, yeah. Your ideas. Your that was a change. That was the biggest change to make. Uh, because at the beginning, remember, we had uh, those uh, uh, executive committee uh, meetings. And it was difficult at the beginning because we had to split the room in two and making sure that the mm. lady were protected. But at the end, they asked us, they were the one asking us, they were the one pushing us to be much more uh, taking a, uh, not risk per se, but take away the curtain. We want to be part. Right. We get the, right. the we, we get uh, our, our, our clothing to protect us. So we want to be. We don't want to be behind the curtain because behind okay. the curtain you cannot see us. Mm -hmm. uh, so they took the risk and they wanted to participate. And when we started to listen to them, as, as since when you you arrived, you start to see that lady were very happy to participate. They had ideas. They Absolutely. wanted to share, and it, it was great. I mean, I think it was. Uh, helping us to create a new environment in our very small Sodexo, in one office, in one Saudi Arabia in, 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 in uh, Daman. But with one small step, we started to build on the new society. And you see today what's happening in Saudi Arabia, uh, where today, I mean, people, women have the right to drive, they can go out, they can, uh, it's much more freedom. So in a way we were in advance. You were ahead, yeah. Ahead of, of the change in a, in a country. But what we have done as Sodexo and as individual, I think we prepare those lady for the change coming. Yeah, that was no. The, the thing. no, that's great. And I think, you know, if I remember correctly, initially you had to have a separate room with the intercom oh, yes. for the companion yes. to go in. But what did you do? Because I thought that was fascinating because when they wanted to have their voice heard and you said they have to participate in some meetings if their you know, ideas are going to count, and you, her, you, the challenge you had was there were some people, some men, right, who were conservative and who resisted, who said that, no, they have to have a Muslim male chaperone with them at all times. <coughs> Tell me a little bit about how you address that situation, because you needed to get those men on your side if the situation was going to open up for them. So just share a little bit about that, how you use the local local change agents, including those that were resistant? Yeah, so what, what we did, number one, is when people have, uh, especially, so the, the biggest issue that came didn't come up from the Saudi citizen. It came up from the expatriates. Right. Uh, so people are coming from other Arab countries or other right. Asian countries, uh, which have been educated or came to the, uh, Saudi Arabia for the last 30 years and were used to such a way to drive life. Right. And didn't understand the change. I mean, maybe the Saudi people uh, were much more aware of the need to change because, again, uh, mm, interesting. Uh, what, but the expatriate uh, community was a bit more resentful of change. And I think the first thing we did was to listen to them. Uh, if you want to be able to influence others, I mean, you cannot give an order. I mean, that's not mm -hmm. doesn't work. So you have to influence. You have to try to show your. But you have to listen to the arguments first. What right. is your argument? Why do you want me? Why do you don't want me, the lady, to come? So, for example, I had an office, and the people didn't want the ladies to come to my office by themselves. I said, okay, so what can we do? I mean, they have to come to see me because they have to get paper to sign, or we have to discuss. 
what can we do? He said, do you want to come every time with them? He said, no, no, I don't want that. So can <laughs> we get two ladies? Can we open the door? I said, yes. So we have to accept their, their, their point to a point and, and see, okay, how can we accommodate the situation? Get them, used, get them used to the change. So we're not trying to break your laws. We're not trying to break your culture, but we are trying to accommodate in this space to people to within our visions. And again, in the fact that to contribute to the, to, to the society, to which you agree before. And so they get used to the change, right? I mean, so we didn't step and um, start by one. So we have uh, everybody was in the same room discussing now. We start very small. So number one, we came with, as you said earlier, uh, we create special rooms. We cannot communicate with them. And because the lady wanted to participate more, they start to say, okay, can we bring you a paper to sign, for example? Yes, you start mm -hmm. with very small step. You always start with small step. You never start with, I mean, uh, the big step. Grand and because, scale, yeah. and advance the change, and you you make sure that is a, there is the reason behind. So, I remember the person I was thinking about, or well, him thinking about, is called Mustafa. But even him at the beginning was extremely resistant uh, to change. But at the end of the day, he started to realize that those people, and of course, then people or those ladies, bring a lot of value because they were mm -hmm. highly educated. Uh, and so he was on, on the finance and accounting uh, job. They were highly educated. They were doing the job much, much better than uh, some other male counterpart. And they were not trying to break the law. They were just trying to be themselves. Yeah. So even he recognized that, yes. So I, I, I could see the conflict because he was what I can call a traditional Muslim, but very conservative. And you can see the conflict because from one point of view, the religion was, look, we cannot accept that, but from a professional point of view, when you saw the value those people were bringing to us, you said, yes, I want that. So I think it became an internal debate. And the idea for me was trying to help. I said, look, we don't want to, we want to respect your culture. We want to respect uh, Islam. How can you help us? So making the agent of change, give us an indication. You saw the, what they can do for us, what they, can, what they want to do. How can you help us? And it gives us some ideas, so I would say not say that they are the best idea in the world, especially if you're coming from a Western world like me, but in that context, because I put him on our side, it works, and he became kind of supporter. So I'm pretty sure deep inside, he was never a true believer in terms of, yeah, I mean, uh, because I think he was an older man, so it's difficult to accept change when you're older. But yeah, he saw the, the, the value of that. And mm -hmm. I know when we left, uh, when I left Saudi Arabia, uh, the biggest change I have that nothing went back to before. Everything mm, kept the same great. way. So, so in a way, we have created we created the condition that the change is not because of me. That's uh, the biggest issue. Uh, the change is because of what you believe. And the people which at the beginning were not supporting you, even when you go, are not going back to the old to the old way. I think can be a small victory. So I know it's only one floor. It's only fifty people. It's not a big change, but. You have made the, the biggest uh, person, I mean, again, uh, I come back to him, which was opposed to that, didn't change anything when I left. And, and I think that would be for me the, something which was very important and show us that we were right. I mean, in a way, the way we pursue was, I would say, the right way. And again, when you came after that and we met in Bahrain, you saw those ladies where, because even here at the beginning, it was difficult for them. All their lives, they've been told, do not speak to foreigners, do not, uh, do not be in the same room as different men, which are not part of your family. Uh, so, and for them to be able to break this quote unquote taboo and start to say, okay, no, I want to be part of the team, I want to communicate, uh, I want to be uh, taking decision with you, be able to meet, to meet you. Uh, that was a, a big step also, but because we created the condition where we learn to trust each other. Mm -hmm. even if we didn't uh, so and again i think you're doing that by respecting where they're coming from uh um, trying to say okay i want you to we want to follow the law of your country we don't want to change the culture of your country that's not our goal our goal is to make sure that uh, you are happy as a human being and you can find your place in the society as per your culture your law your language and everything and mm -hmm. the fact we took the time to respect that really was a uh, uh, yeah. makes I think help us a lot and the second I mean one of the ele elements you have also that it is it was good for business at the end of the day I mean let's right. go back to uh, business business world because we are a business it wasn't a cost for us so we moved from a situation where we had to pay because yeah. we didn't have enough Saudi citizens where we didn't have to pay anymore and the money were given to for promote other human beings and it was creating value for us 
And right. that was fantastic. That, yes. I think we succeeded a lot. Yeah. So I think that's awesome because it really was seizing a business opportunity. You've got good talent, educated talent, committed. Yes. yes. You yep. save money because you didn't have to pay the fee. So all around yep. it was a win-win. What was great was the fact that you also understood the context very well. You partnered with the locals, right? Even those that were yes. most resistant to help you to bring about the change, you know, by understanding, you know, what their logic was and shifting them incrementally. And I think what was excellent is how you said that it's not big steps, it can be small steps that add up and you have to start somewhere. So you can't That's take, correct. you know, the whole, you know, uh, enchilada, as we say, right? The whole <laughs> the problem, yes. right? You have to kind of piece it and take it, find the right entry point and then build from it. And then the great success was the sustainability. Even when you were taken out, it continues, which I think is continues. a testament to yes. So can you share a success story of any of the women, anything, any success story that you can share uh, of any of the women, um, you know, in terms uh, I, of how they went on to... I, I, I will share two, two yeah. moments, which I think uh, make me understood or make me, made me realize, sorry, uh, that I was on the good, we as a team were on the good right. path. The first time when the lady started to speak up, so on a regular basis, uh, we had the, what we call executive committee reunion. So we're trying to manage the destiny of the company, take decisions. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, we, we invited the ladies uh, because again, of the jobs, not because of who they are, but because they were having function of supervisor and manager. So they needed to be in that team. And, uh, at the beginning, you start to ask them to participate, but because you're facing so many years of culture not to speak, nobody's speaking up. And it went for quite some time, so it's quite uh, difficult per se. I mean, uh, while well, you're having people and you know that you're going to speak by yourself for most of the time, so you have meetings for two days, and it's going to be kind of a monologue. So it's mm -hmm. quite boring and difficult. It's not what you're as a leader. It's not what I'm looking at. So we have to educate the people. And the, the first moment was. Uh, when the lady started to speak up mm -hmm. and share the ideas, share the opinions, uh, give us recommendations on what we said, what was correct, not correct. That was wow. And I remember the time was uh, we had a Saudi colleague called Osama. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was such a shock because for him also was the first time when he heard a lady spoke and share her views outside the family uh, circle. And so that was a kind of wow, wow moment. And again, and the more those ladies started to stand up and say, okay, this is what I believe on. This is what my recommendation is. Uh, I would agree with that. I disagree with this. Uh, and the more they took confidence and the more you can see the, the as you said, the culture, the, the, the education, the, what we wanted to see in any managers coming out. And that was fantastic. That was my first moment when I say, okay, mm -hmm. that's a good step. That's we moved great. from nobody, say, nobody saying anything to, hey, I'm starting to participate and start to be an active member of your team. That's fantastic. And the second moment, I think it's going as today. I mean, uh, so as I said to you, and today, I mean, I've been, uh, I left the country what, almost four years now. Right. We are still in contact via LinkedIn. We are still in contact with a few of those ladies. They're moving on. They, they start. Awesome. They keep, so, so some of them stay where we were before but other ones moved to other companies and are still cli climbing the ladder. So the foundation we built again, a, a, I think where, as I said, number one, the, the first good sign is when I left, nobody destroyed the foundation. That's right. So it wasn't, it wasn't done against other people. People start to realize and share my views, but also for those people, those ladies, uh, they, some of them choose to, like anybody else, they choose to leave the company and work somewhere else. And they grew the ladder. They're still growing the ladder. So it's fantastic. I mean, the, it built, okay, so I, look, I would not be arrogant to the point taking the ownership of this, but I think somewhere, somehow, I contributed, I and Sodexo, I have to be fair, contributed to the development of those people so they can be very active person in their societies, in their environment. So I wasn't trying to change everything, but just changing them. And I'm very happy for them. Look, uh, that would be my second, uh, I would say, my uh, happy, happy moment. Because that's, they are becoming citizens of Saudi Arabia, and I think they are contributing much more to their country wealth and uh, development um, that they were doing before. So that's for me, my second That's uh, awesome. That's great. That's, that's terrific. So just in closing, is there 
you know, anything that you might have done differently in hindsight? And then, you know, what advice do you have for those that are leading global transformation around the world? Any, anything you might have done differently and any advice that you have? What I would have done differently, uh, Rainy, would be uh, I would have taken more time. So I was so much focused on the Saudis. Right. So on the group of people, whether they were male or female, and the, the way it's going to work in the company that I forgot, in a way, the people I had today, which were the expatriates. Mm. And the way the people came back to me, I didn't expect that, if you want. I was so much more in the belief that the expatriate we see very quickly what we wanted to do. Right. the values and everything, I didn't expect them, or few of them, not everybody, but few of them to become the biggest block, resistance mm -hmm. block. So mm -hmm. I didn't, uh, I know, for example, today, we, we are having a lot of changes still today in the DNI world. And we take for granted that a group of people will say, oh, yeah, okay, I understand that. But I think we have to take the time to make sure that everybody understand why we're doing it. Mm -hmm. If you understand the why, it's going to be much more easier to drive the result. Uh, and again, so uh, uh, for me, again, I, I, when I speak to my team, I, I know we have uh, today, I mean, Sodexo, in, in our Western world, we are speaking a lot about the, uh, the woman condition. And I will stay only on the woman because that's something, again, I get skin in the game. I mean, I get my daughter, I get my wife. And I want to make sure that they have the right to succeed as much as I do. I mean, it's not because sure. I'm a male that I should be different. And I was speaking with my daughter last time, which is 13 year old. And she said, look, uh, and we were trying to spend, we are trying to discuss in the car. So she was going to see her friends and say, I want to make sure to you that I give you as much chances as I give to your brother. Mm -hmm. And so that was my vision uh, at the time. So I skin in the game because I, I, my wife, which is Asian and uh, Rainy, I mean, people in Asia are really always a little bit very soft, very uh, good listener. And I saw my wife has to change again in Saudi Arabia because again, she was treated as a servant per se because she was from Indonesia and she was a female. No respect at all. So she has to change totally to change so her attitude. Treated as a treated as a, a servant, you know, Indonesia. I mean uh, so Indonesian. You have Filipino, to give some, uh, yeah, give some context yeah. because people may not know because a lot of okay, so, the domestic so, help comes yeah, from Indonesia and yes, exactly. in India, Bangladesh, right? Yeah. Exactly. So and so it was tough for me yeah. to see that. Yeah, but yeah. I start to realize that also all the ladies, uh, and again, all ladies, you have to respect them. So again, the fact was some kind of, I mean, I'm not a lady, don't get me wrong here, but I, I wanted to make sure that the world for my wife, the world right. for my daughter can it's change for them. Yeah. It's a better place for them. So that's part of my skin in the game is right. what can I do to contribute for that? Right. Uh, and again, with other people and uh, trying to follow that. So that I think it's important to get some skin in the game. And making sure that you understand the situation again i made a mistake and if i had to do it again i would make sure that I, I, again i didn't realize mm -hmm. how disruptive that change would be for the expatriates because i say okay when you're, you're you're expatriate you always go back to your country you go back to what you okay. see and again i mean uh, we have a lot of uh, asian people from uh, uh, working for us in saudi arabia but you go to india you go to indonesia you, you can see in bangladesh you, have, you can see the i mean i don't know yeah pakistan also you can see the women having important role in the society right so that was my assumption and i make right. a similar mistake so right. uh, i would say that okay. yeah excellent yeah, I, I should have to make sure that everybody in the team was uh, so i was too much focusing on the saudis and not mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. i will i will change that so really, that's an excellent learning in terms of really getting a, a good picture of the power dynamics, the yes, yes. dominant subordinate groups, a holistic 360 picture, because sometimes you Correct. focus on one and you forget that, you know, the, the totality of the picture. I think that's that's an excellent point. Um, so any, any advice, uh, just last minute advice or closing thoughts? I think we've covered a lot, but anything in terms of those working around the world? No, yeah. Advice for them? Always value, I mean, my advice is uh, I didn't do it because I had to do it. Right. I, I did it because I believed into it. And too many right. times today I see people doing it just to get uh, an authority to speak like this, to get the bonus or to tick the Excel spreadsheet. And I think, no, you have to believe into it. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that you have to. And again, mm -hmm. I was speaking about the, the cause of, of, of the women's. So clearly, uh, 
I'm, I'm not related directly to that. I am related indirectly. So my mission is trying to help my family. And by doing so, I want to do so. I have to mm -hmm. help all people other, around me. So uh, making sure that works. Uh, listen to the front line. I mean, uh, my team today, when we work in the US, so we're working offshore. We get different race, different uh, age. We have the diversity on the new woman's age, race, and everything. Um, and we're trying to, I'm trying to listen to people on the front line. How can I help you? Mm -hmm. I'm here to help. How can mm -hmm. I help you? Let me know what are your issues or your possibility or your opportunities. It cannot be only negative, it has to be positive also. And see what, how can I contribute? Mm -hmm. uh, that would be my, uh, my advice. Great. I mean, it's important for Sodexo, as you know, Rainy has very strong values. Mm -hmm. And if you can start to adapt to them and making sure that people on the front line see the benefits for them, it's going to be much more easier. Awesome, awesome, awesome. This was fantastic. So this last piece was really good in terms of, you know, as a global leader, to really internalize the benefits of this work, not just doing it to check the box or to get some yeah. money, but believing in it and uh, really disrupting your worldview. So I think you beautifully articulated this first principle in my book, which is make it local. Uh, yeah, which really you. what you did was, you know, understood the context, understood the environment, uh, learned a little bit about the people. With, and with that knowledge, you really pushed for change, but you partnered with the local change agents in order to make that happen. So fantastic example and uh, really you, appreciate Annie. what you're doing and look forward to, uh, you know, learning more from you as we progress. So uh, Thank you again for being here. And uh, for those that are listening in, we are going to the, uh, explore the second principle in the book next month, which is leaders change to lead change. So you'll be hearing from another leader next month. Thank you, Alain. Thank you, Rainy.